Welcome to VCR, a vintage cinema rewind. We're bringing old movies to new viewers. I'm Blake. And I'm Michael. And I can't think of a joke to start this one with. <laughs> <laughs> Just having that kind of day, eh? Yeah, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's all right. We've got you. Our... S- you said let's just get started, and I went okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> okay. Well, you know, we've got our our last part of our Jodie Foster uh, series. Today. That's right. A little sad, actually. Are you? Um, yeah, I've been really enjoying these movies. I'm you sad know. for different reasons, <laughs> more existential reasons, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> that's exterior to the podcast. Yeah. Uh, subscribe to our patreon to learn more about my personal problems <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so we're doing contact this is part two our spoiler full discussion so if you've never seen this movie before it's a sci-fi you should really go back to our prior episode and check it out there where we go into all the the spoiler free discussion about this movie being a, a jodie foster vehicle matthew mcconaughey early on in his career just a really good sci-fi all around and who it's for and and if you're may enjoy it on and where you can check it out so that being said we're about to dive full on into spoilers uh we are leaving the stratosphere yeah (laughs) i guess that's it let's just hop right into it um starting in front of the camera working our way back what i want to say just to start off with things is i thought jodie foster did a really great job throughout the movie of conveying a passion for space and and just you know contact through through the means that they have contact with like she she was really passionate throughout and i think that part of that and and part of what the film does well is it actually in the first you know 10 minutes or so really dives into jodie foster's background and why this is also important to her as well right they certainly give uh they certainly give a good reason for it in terms of her backstory um yeah well spoiler alert in the spoiler section like her dad really nurtured her love of science and then he died so quite tragically yeah and there's kind of that heartbreaking shot at the beginning where she's trying to talk to her dead father using this like right radio technology that he gave her yeah so like a cb radio kind of cb radio yeah so that sort of tells you everything you need to know about her later on um, there's that scene earlier where she says to her dad, like, do you think she's asking him, like, how far the CB radio can reach? And then she says, like, do you think we can talk to mom with the CB radio? And he's like, well, yeah. And, and everybody collectively other than her is just like, ooh, ooh, sad. Yeah. So, yeah, a very, a very heartbreaking story like a background to the character you know she's been through a pretty traumatic i have to say though as soon as the dad showed up i took one look at him and i was like that motherfucker's gonna die (laughs) 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 he is not making out of this prologue yeah it it did feel a little bit like that's where things were maybe going but no i thought i thought that was a pretty good opener in in terms of building up the character and, and kind of why why this is so important to her uh as we get into the movie uh, why it's you know it's not just a job or it's not just it's not just the science behind it or or the idea of first contact it's just there's something bigger you know it's carrying on a legacy there yeah and i i also want to mention at this point too that this is maybe one of the best camera shots in the entire movie is in the opening scene where she's you know her father has died and then she's like i'm going to go get you the medicine and she runs back and runs up along the hallway and it's like it like zooms out and kind of pans around and it's it's she was actually like in the mirror they were filming it do you do you know what camera shot i'm talking about? i'm drawing a blank how here how do you miss that that's like the coolest shot of the whole movie the whole movie i was just like how did they do that okay <laughs> wow I, i'm i'm speechless i was i was uh, planning on having a whole discussion about this. okay well you can it'll just be kind of a one-sided discussion <laughs> <laughs> it was really cool i just wanted to say that it was it was really like it, not only was it cool, but it was it was really well shot. Like I, I, I don't know. I've lost my I've lost my train of thought now. I was just so shocked that you weren't you you didn't even notice. I it. did see this movie like a week ago. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, that is the problem to separating our shooting here a little bit. Wee oui, wee. Oui. But anyway, really really cool shot. I think it was a mixture of 
special effects like using CGI and multiple camera angles, but it really turned out really cool. I thought it was I thought it was really a, a high point of the cinematography of the film. Yeah. There's some other cool shots in this film as well, but that's just in the opener. There's a lot of detail in this film, and I think part of that is because, you know, it's being adapted from Carl Sagan's novel in and of itself was originally meant to be a screenplay. And so that's kind of a balance that you have to do when you're adapting a novel, right? Is how much do you tell? How much backstory to you, do you tell? How much how much build up do you show kind of thing? All of that, right? Yeah. And there's actually like, I did look it up. There are some pretty significant differences between the book yeah. and the movie. Yeah, for sure. And the sense that I want to talk about, you know, like we do, it does take a little while for this film to really get to the core of, of where things are heading, right? Like, you know, we get Ellie in very early in her career and we meet Dr. Drumlin, her superior who shuts down the program and, you know, there's all the drama there and then her going and looking for funding and how long it takes to get the extra funding. Mm -hmm. There's all of, you know, they finally get the funding and then it's years later at this point kind of thing, right? Like, yeah, it jumps forward four years. Yeah, like this movie has a lot of jumps. Um, it, It's really all about Ellie's life from childhood all the way to adulthood. Becoming, yeah, yeah. Well into her, her adulthood. You know, I, I think that this movie does a pretty good job with it. Now, you know, you could probably debate whether or not the first 30 minutes is a little over long because you know we don't get really into the exciting i bit. did kind of think it was funny just from a structural standpoint how she's working for seti and then they've got their funding cut and then they decide to try and make it work and then we jump forward four years and they're in a different state in a different facility and their funding is threatening to be cut again like to me, it was just like, are we have we been through this before? Yeah, right? it almost see, yeah, and that's kind of what I was getting at a little bit. Like, really, the only the first time it really only just shows how at odds Jodie Foster and Drumlin are. Um, yeah, but, you know, like that's also kind of prevalent throughout the rest of the movie anyway. And and there's some couple of offhand quotes even in the first act with them at the original research facility where she's like oh you know he hates me like he he's always undermining me and all of this stuff right i guess the funding thing does kind of lead to her meeting the eccentric billionaire uh, he's not a billionaire at that point he's just some guy he's just some guy maybe i'm remembering <laughs> oh, this wrong oh, no you're okay yeah you're kind of all over the place now <laughs> yeah um no, oh that's after the fact right this is way after the fact um no but doesn't she go into that boardroom and then there's the cameraman and then the she's asking for funding and yeah from haddon facilities but right she doesn't meet haddon until like way later on in the film that's true but it still introduces yep. the character yeah, indirectly and, and, and so and so yeah there's that is maybe the one reason why they had to go back and do the original one to kind of build that like there is there is stuff that they're building towards right they're putting pieces yeah on the, on yeah the board. and so you know maybe there are spots you could cut maybe not like i i think it was just it took a little while to get going in this one and i think ultimately for me the payoff is all worth it because all of these pieces really come together the chessboard everything's starting to play out kind of thing it's just there's a lot of setup into this. Mm -hmm. We also meet uh, Palmer Joss as well early on, and it kind of builds, you know, Ellie and Palmer Joss's relationship early. So, so there is pieces that are being put on the board again, but you know, the film really doesn't pull me in until we get to the big scene, the moment where you know Ellie's out in the car that all of the like the radar dishes, yeah, yeah. They, they all. They all at one point just move and they pick up the their first contact, right? Right. That's the point in the movie where I was like, okay, I'm in. Oh, wow. Like, yeah, something's happening. Yeah. Like, yeah, definitely. And throughout the rest of the movie, like, that's the part that I was gripped. And the rest of the movie, I was like fully engaged, like 100% okay. in. I have a gripe. All right. I'd like to get into my gripe. I was not as high on this movie as you were. Yeah. I do. I did kind of feel that the second act kind of dragged. And I also felt that a lot of the commentary was a little heavy-handed especially the whole science versus religion thing right yeah i i think that was maybe granted it all kind of came together at the end mm -hmm. but it was just a little heavy-handed and a little on the nose at times so here's the thing is and i actually did think about that as well um so 
this movie basically it shows the positives and negatives to each of like science religion politics yeah and so in each one like i said it it well shows the positives of each it also shows heavily the negatives of each of those ideologies and for science i thought they did a really good job with drumlin's faults in science where it's like you know there's some politics involved it's capitalist yeah, yeah it's, it's capitalist. like it's got to make money yeah. yeah and that is science actually as well like in a nutshell like a lot of science is capitalism heavy as well mm. so i think that that i was like that's a really great way to show some of the faults in science and who's funding the science like you know who who stands to gain from the scientific research being done right and what's the bias in the science whereas yeah. they're the other part of what they were really trying to push which i didn't necessarily think was as well done and this is where you're saying is like a lot more heavy-handed was the idea of faith versus concrete evidence right and and that was the you know that's the big sticking point between ellie and palmer joss is i can't see god therefore i don't believe in god and I think that there's a fault in, in showing that because that's not even necessarily science, like in a sense, because science is full of theories and ideas, right? Like, yeah, we have so many theories, like the theory of relativity. It's not the like law of relativity. It's the theory <laughs> yeah. of relativity. We can't reach out and touch it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so I think that that almost does the film a disservice to really, you know, dive into that thought process. And, and, you know, it kind of comes back around at the end, like you said, and it, it kind of, it gets a little interesting, but then again, it heavy handed, like at one point in time later on in the film, you know, after everything's happened and Ellie's sitting there at the political hearing and the one guy literally says to her, what am I supposed to do? Take this on faith? Ah! And I was like, <laughs> I can't believe he said it. I literally yeah. looked at Jess and I was like, I can't believe he, he said, it. said it. Because yeah. like for five minutes, that's what they were hammering over and over again, right? Was like, we're supposed to just take what you say to like at your word kind of thing. And and then when the, he said that, I was like, that was too much. <laughs> oh, I th there was a moment where I was like, oh, come on. I think it was when she's in the machine and it's turning up. And it's turning on and activating. And one of the scientists literally says, my God. And I was like, all right. <laughs> mm -hmm. So while I do agree with you, like I also share that gripe a little bit. I thought in the second act, I, I was really entranced by, you know, there's this big like camp that pops up around the SETI satellites. Right. Right. Um, and, you know, we see all of the different reactions and it's kind of almost like a montage because Jodie Foster is driving in her uh, car through everything. And we see all of these different people reacting in all sorts of like extreme and different ways. Right. Right. By the way, I feel like in terms of just the legacy of this movie, jumping ahead a bit, like I feel like I've seen that scene parodied so many times oh absolutely like i think king of the hill did an episode about that where it's just just you just see a bunch of people in the desert waiting for aliens to show up right but it's not just that as well right it's just like you know it's some people who are religious extremists and they're talking about the end of the world there's mm -hmm. other people who are like oh like let's praise these new alien overlords there's like you know people out there partying just for like the sake of partying like, there's neo-nazis there's yeah there's literally yeah. everything and and i thought that that does a really good job because in in such a small scene it just portrays like so many different reactions right and so many right. realistic human reactions so many to, conflicting reactions yeah to such a big event mm -hmm. um and it, it felt to me like very honest um, yeah and so like i said while i agree with you with some of that gripe i do think that it's important because that was really i think a lot of the focus of the film is showing the big picture and actually that's that's a bigger idea that i was having with this film is contact is not necessarily about the characters and and it's not necessarily a a character drama and it doesn't necessarily care as much about that it's about the bigger ideas here i think it's about what would happen when humans make contact with extraterrestrials. It's about, you know, the constant battle between politics, science, and religion. Like, it's all of these big themes coming together, and we're using the characters as vessels to explore these ideas. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I mean, like, you've got Palmer Joss, who is essentially representing 
the spiritual side, and then you've got Drumlin representing the stone cold capitalist side, and then you've got Jodie Foster, who's basically also on the scientific side as well. Yeah, James Woods is in the the military side. Yeah. Rob Lowe is there for some reason, and. <laughs> Um, yeah, I guess the characters are more kind of archetypes than they are characters, except for Ellie. Like, she's yeah. still relatively nuanced and complex. Right. We need at least one of character to be that, right? To be that right. person that, you know, we follow throughout the film who has some sort of revelation by the end. Pretty much, yeah. But otherwise, like, it's it's really, you know, big. It's, it's even got, like, Haddon representing, you know, the crazy mega wealthy uh person of the era which has aged in i was gonna say world. like watching this movie i was like this has aged phenomenally yeah. like a bald billionaire floating around in space yeah. like congratulations movie you did it <laughs> <laughs> that's what i mean a lot of this stuff is not only is it timeless but a lot of it has aged relatively well yeah i'd agree with that um, especially the whole especially like if i can go there like the whole post-COVID anti-vaxxer movement. Well, I mean, the whole anti-science thing kind of has taken on a new life in the whole post-COVID world. Right. Right? People are just like, meh, I don't trust science. Right. And and there, and that's the politics behind things as well. And so the movie does a really good job with that. And it kind of brings about the timeless aspect of all of that. Like, as soon as Haddon came on, I was like... Did they know about Elon Musk? Yeah, Jeff Bezos. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the Zuck? <laughs> yeah, fair enough. So, yeah, so we get the first contact, and we get into, like, it's pretty heavy into the science and mathematics of all of it, right? It's about prime numbers and how prime numbers can occur naturally in the real world in the sense that they're they're being shot out, right? Um, it would take intelligent life to understand that what's being sent to them is in fact like coming from another intelligent life form and then what's really cool is so i actually have to rewind back to the very beginning of this movie before we even meet ellie when we're we see the shot of earth and we hear you know the radio playing and it's very timely music and then we start to zoom out past earth and as we get further and further out we're getting out into like further further radio broadcasts as as we get older and older right mm. and i thought that was a really cool opening because it shows like how you know, even now, like our our radio technology, when it broadcasts out, it broadcasts like out out, and so those radio broadcasts are actually being shot out into space even as we speak. And that essentially, it takes time because they don't move at the speed of light. It takes time for those radio waves to move out. Um, huh. And so we're actually broadcasting out into the larger universe at, in a sense. Wow, that sounds like a lot of noise pollution. Interesting. And and so I thought that was really effectively done because again, like I'm about to get to, it gets comes back around because they realize that not only have they been sent this audio of the prime numbers, they've been sent <laughs> Hitler's opening address at the Olympics. Can I it's funny, like when the image they found the image and it's all blurry and they're doing the whole enhance, enhance, enhance. Right. I was like, oh haha, it's a swastika. I was joking, right? <laughs> and then I was like, oh my god, it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, very unexpected, but also a very well thought out plot point right because it uh, suddenly like now the military's fully alert right yeah um, because we we've been sent like a very fascist media back from the aliens like we don't know it like if they've agreed with this and that's why they're sending it back to right us, and w one of the scientists makes the point that it's like they're just sending it back to us as a way of saying like hey yeah we hear you right yeah, but exactly. it's still like it certainly gets your attention oh, and absolutely. it's certainly disturbing in its implications like like i said there's all these neo-nazis out at in the desert just having a great neo-nazi time yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I thought that was really interesting because as well, and, and it makes sense too, right? If you think about the timeline, they were saying it takes 26 years for that to get to them. 
then it takes 26 years to for it to be sent back to Earth. Right. Like, all of the science and mathematical aspects of it, again, being a bit of a science math nerd, really, really appreciated all of it. As not being a science or a math nerd, I was kind of struggling to keep up at times. <laughs> it's like, what are we doing? Okay. Yeah, yeah, that, and that's fair. And I think that I was kind of expecting you to maybe say that, especially with the prime numbers. That's not something you're probably used to. I barely know what a number is. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so, so we get all of this aspect... And then it comes back around to Haddon again because they find that they've been sent instructions in all of this information, but it's all written in alien lingo. So how are we ever going to decode all of this information? Mm -hmm. And that's where Ellie finally meets the funder, the the anonymous funder, essentially, or the eccentric Haddon, the guy who's running all of this. And he has figured it out with probably the help of his science and engineers. And they give her the key to uncode all of this information, right? Right. And again, that's where you first meet Haddon, and you're like, how did they know? Yeah, how indeed. Yeah. From that point in time, there we find out that what they've sent is instructions to build some sort of machine. Yeah, this is where the movie gets a little more interesting for me. It's where definitely where things get a lot more sci-fi-ish, right? Yeah. Um, because they they sent this massive machine that they think they're they're really not sure what it's going to do either. yeah they're just told to build it on on faith essentially and uh james woods's character makes the point he's like what if it's just a nuke like what if they trick us into nuking ourselves yeah blowing up the entire planet with some like you know catastrophic type of weapon yeah um, and to be fair he's right to be suspicious yeah no, especially yeah, they so might be space nazis <laughs> like, yeah well and and that comes to like if you're really into like all of the ideas of science and stuff like that i'd recommend reading about the dark forest theory um it's essentially a theory that we haven't heard anything from other aliens because other aliens are basically trying to be quiet because they're afraid of what's in the forest what else is in the forest essentially Ooh, that is spooky i'm googling that right now <laughs> so you can read it later <laughs> no highly recommend it it's a it's a very interesting theory throughout all of contact everything is so grounded and so realistic and it's really you know in the third act when they start to build the machine that things really take the turn for the sci-fi because you know while while technically a machine like this is potentially possible we don't know right it is it does lean in more into that heavy sci-fi aspect and so the machine itself is is really interesting because it's i mean it's freaking huge right yeah it's like cost like what trillions of dollars yeah it's cost yes yeah, someone in the range of like a couple trillion dollars to make and again because of the nature of it because of how large it is how much government spending and that means public spending it is it's very open out in the open like you know all of the world is watching essentially right mm -hmm. and not all of the world is happy about it either no one country japan in particular doesn't want anything to do with it right as which kind of ties into a plot point later yeah um, but very tightly written movie <laughs> yeah for the most part the uh, beginning's a little flabby, but yeah. hey. Then it gets to the point where, you know, somebody has to go into the machine, right? Like, it's built like a vessel. Mm -hmm. And we don't know if the... Basically, the way it's designed is there's a little sphere where somebody goes into it. It drops below into all of these uh, moving rings. Like, a little spear in a big spear, yeah. essentially. And, and then, you know, there's a question of, is this going to launch somebody into space is this going to open up some sort of wormhole like w what is the point of all of this right yeah and it's interesting how again nobody really knows what's gonna do and it's presumed to be like there's that one astronaut who is a front runner to use it but he literally his kids talk him out of going right because he's like we like i could die like i have no idea yeah like yeah. so that's the next part of the movie is Who's going to be involved in this? And Ellie is obviously, not only is she one of the frontrunners in this, she's really passionate about going. Right. And of course, Drumlin's also somebody who's heavily involved in this. Yeah, this is another part of the movie where it got a little heavy-handed for me, because basically, Ellie's speaking to this uh, council that has been formed to try and determine right. who the best representative is and they start asking her a lot of really religious questions well palmer joss really 
pushes that uh, yeah. off because he's on the the committee that's going to ultimately decide who is the most capable person, who is the best representation of humanity to send to the aliens. Yeah, and Ellie pretty much sticks to her guns and tells the council she doesn't really believe in any god. Right, because and- because Palmer Joss really sets her up, right? Like, yeah. Like, really sets her and up. And he admits to it later, yep. because he kind of has feelings for her, and he doesn't want her to go. Yeah. But just, to me, that point felt just a little heavy-handed. And maybe that's a part that hasn't aged as well, because, I mean, we're living in a very secular society here in the West, right? Yeah. I mean, maybe things are a little different down in the States than in Canada, but it just felt a little weird to me that they're asking this scientist all these religious questions Uh, see and here's the thing is i actually wasn't as off put by that because again their their thought process as a as a committee of all these different people all these different ideology ideologies and you know palmer joss is sitting on that committee for a reason he's not just sitting on there because he's a scientist the guy knows nothing about science he knows nothing about technology or engineering or anything Mm -hmm. like that like he is sitting on that as a represent representative of americans religious values sure so that is what he's been assigned why he's on that committee and so i think it's valid for him to bring that up because obviously the committee had value in having that there. And so I don't actually, I don't actually have a fault in that. Uh, Like, obviously he pushed her and pushed her and pushed her, but here's, here's what's more interesting. I I, like, I actually no problem with any of that. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I actually thought what really inter- what's really interesting about all of this scene is the follow up to it and how, you know, Drumlin essentially sells himself out. Oh yeah. He just totally, he gives a very political answer where he's just like, yeah. And he says uh, God in his answer. Yeah. Yeah. And he's like, I accept all like he's, it's like, he's running for president. Like, he's just like, yes, I'm fully, he's like, what do you believe? I believe it too. Exactly. Yeah. So, and, and, and Ellie makes a great point. Like he's just telling you what you want to hear. Like he doesn't care about any of this. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and uh, he's a little bit of a sociopath probably. Right. You know, he he understands the game. Really well, well, by this point in the movie, he's already taken credit for a lot of her work, too. Yep. He's positioned himself in the spotlight. Like, yeah, yeah, he's a real, he's a real SOP. <laughs> yeah. So I don't ha- I don't have any of the problems that you do in that scene because I thought all of it makes sense in that aspect. But it it builds towards maybe the most unexpected point of the whole movie for me when they are about to do their first test run of the machine. And Drumlin's on location. Ellie's back in command center, making sure everything goes to plan. And as we see, you know, as, as, you know, the camera's panning around and everybody's doing their job, a familiar face pops up. And, you know, again, he's, he's a pretty familiar looking guy because he looks just like, uh, Gary Busey as well. (laughs) That's right. It's, uh, it's Jake Busey back again. He's the religious crazy leader who's basically created this Armageddon cult who we see very ominously in that shot with the car, which seeing all of the people interacting and partying around this pop-up city along the SETI satellites. And Ellie notices him there just by chance. Right. She notices that he's there. And then so there's this really dramatic buildup where... You know, at one point I'm like, does he just have a knife? Like, is he planning on killing Drummond or something? But it's even crazier than that. Like, he's completely strapped himself full of bombs. Yeah, it's a Christian suicide bomber. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I didn't even notice the uh, how interesting that is, eh? <laughs> Yeah. So he blows up the machine. And it's, like, completely unexpected. I did not see that I coming. didn't see that coming either. That was genuinely threw me for a loop. Yeah, because at that point... You know, all hope is lost. Like, Drumlin's dead. This explosion has happened. There's no way they're ever going to get the authorization to do this again, right? Right. For how much it cost. And, you know, the backlash towards it. Like, it, it just seems like it's over, basically. And, mm-hmm. you know, Ellie Ellie lives, and, and that's great. But at the same time, it's that despair of, of not getting to find out who's behind You could almost the- end the movie right there. Yeah. I mean, it wouldn't be satisfying, but it would be an ending. Right. But then it turns out the eccentric space billionaire has secretly funded a second machine. Yeah. In Japan. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Haddon has built himself his own separate machine just in case. 
And the movie is, you know, this is where the movie's really moving at quite a pace because it's like, we have to do this now before anybody realizes essentially yeah, yeah. anything bad happens here because the, the security clearance on a machine like this would have been insane. And yet somehow Jake Busey was able to to get in there get and in bloat there. it up. Yeah. yeah. So things are moving to pace. Like Ellie's the obvious choice to be on there. And Palmer Joss, I imagine... I don't know how much say Palmer Joss even has at this point. Like, you know, even though her and Ellie have talked to each other, like, and it's heartbreaking that she doesn't get to go on the first trip. Yeah. Well, it's kind of implied that the billionaire is just like, this is my machine and I pick Ellie. Yeah. Like, there's no real conversation about, well, who goes now? It's just, yeah, it's you. Get in there. (laughs) Yeah, that's, that's almost essentially exactly what happens. And then we get to see what happens with the machine. And this is where... This is where the movie really came alive for me in particular. Yeah. I was like, okay, we're doing this now. Like, let's mm-hmm. do it. It's very exciting, like, 10 minutes um, when when things start getting booted up and then she's in the machine and she's saying, okay to go, okay to go. And they can almost, like, can't even hear her. And we, even, we haven't even mentioned William Fitchner's character as well here. He's uh, the blind scientist, Kent Clark. Uh, is- uh, do you get it? <laughs> oh, I get it. And... Kent Clark is, he's a blind scientist who's been with Ellie the, in, her entire career, essentially. And, you know, throughout the movie, we see that he picks up on things that other people don't hear. Right. And he's got a very analytic mind. And, you know, while she's in the machine, everything's kind of going crazy. All of the electronics aren't quite working. They can't really hear what she's saying, but he can hear her just barely make out that she's saying, okay to go, okay to go, right? Right, right. Um, because they really only have one shot at this at this point in time. Pretty much, yeah. You know, with all of this uncertainty, like, they aren't sure if, if they should continue or not, basically. And and they basically have to... There's one button, you have no time to think. You either hit the button and she goes, or, or sorry, you, you hit the button and everything aborts. And who knows when this project will ever happen, or... You leave it and see what happens, and Ellie lives or dies. Yep, and they decide to launch it. Yeah, and then it gets, it goes from grounded sci-fi to hard sci-fi. Oh yeah, it does. Yeah, like two hours in. Yeah, but it's a good build-up to that, right? Yeah, it was. And and so Ellie's transported through a wormhole in the machine to almost like a separate dimension. Kind of. She theorizes that it's like some sort of transit system. Yeah. Like it's like a wormhole, way station, subway kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And so she's sent there and, you know, she sees all this cool space stuff, like all these galaxies and multiple star systems and stuff like that. And the whole time she's talking into her, like, earpiece. Yeah. Like, transcribing her thoughts or whatever. Yeah, and and she's not even sure if anybody can hear her, essentially. She's just doing her best to document everything. Mm Mm-hmm. And she's sent on to this plane of existence where there's a beach and, you know, this weird... All these alien stars. Yeah. Yeah. And as some... This thing starts walking up to her, and it it's, operates into her father. It's almost like a creature made of smoke, and then it just turns into her dad. Yeah. And you know what? I have to admit, like, part of me wants to roll my eyes and say that's a little cliche. Another part of me is like, okay, like, mm-hmm. it's all coming together. <laughs> like, right, right. We're tying it. We're bringing it all home. Yeah. And and what they essentially say is, you know, we, we're the aliens who sent this to you. And, and this is where all the exposition of, like, here's the explanation of everything that you don't understand up until now. This is the best explanation we can give you. Yeah. And they basically say, you know, we've looked into your mind and this is the most unsettling thing that we can present ourselves as to have this kind of conversation. Well, the most comfortable thing we can present ourselves as. Yeah. 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 And so they have the conversation about how this is the first their first contact how you know they're not even the ones that created this machine that was the thing that i found the most interesting the aliens were just like she's like well who created this machine they're just like i don't know like 
we don't know. It's billions of years old. Like maybe they'll come back one day. Right. That to me was the most humbling moment where it's like, oh, even the aliens don't understand everything. Yeah. Like even the aliens are just t- doing their best. Yeah. And and they're like, you know, we're there's like a galactic empire almost essentially of different species that we've we've done this with before. Like you aren't the first person that we're reaching out to. Yeah. Um, but this is kind of how things go, right? And then he basically says that point where he's like, you know, all creatures are lonely and the only thing that makes the loneliness better is each other. Yeah, right? what a poetic like line, right? Yeah. So memorable. Pretty much, yeah. I will admit the cynical part of my brain was kind of rolling my eyes at that moment because it's like, do you mean to tell me I spent trillions of dollars and traveled halfway across the universe just so you could stress the importance of empathy and community? <laughs> like, come on, man. But on the other hand, it really... It's not that I even disagree with the sentiment. It's just it's just me. I'm a dick, okay? Is that what you guys want to hear? <laughs> <laughs> you don't like tug at the heartstrings like sentimental. I guess not, no. <laughs> not in this movie anyway. Oh man. See, and I was fully supportive of it. And actually and what we didn't say in the primer episode when we were talking about who this movie is for is I I was thinking about this a lot recently because I've been I picked up the Expanse series again. Um mm-hmm. and the Expanse series dives into a lot of these thoughts and ideas, and even there's a moment where there's a character who gets the Ali's father treatment some at some point in the series, and it's it's very similar to that. It's very similar to you know the human experience and all of these different thoughts and ideas. And actually, there's a really beautiful quote from this point as well, where the alien says, you know, he describes the humanity as a species, and I've got it here. He says. You're an interesting species, an interesting mix. You're capable of such beautiful dreams and such horrible nightmares. You feel so lost, so cut off, so alone. Only you're not. See, in all our searching, the only thing that we found that makes the emptiness bearable is each other. And so it kind of comes back to what you're saying, but just a little bit, you know, more more. abstract. Yeah. And it's it's a really beautiful quote. And again, it, it made me think a lot about the Expanse series because the Expanse is while there's a sci-fi element to it, there's a futuristic element to it. It's a, it's a lot about humanity and a lot of it is timeless mm, because yeah. we've, we've been essentially the same physiologically, like it, mentally we've, we're, we've been the same for the last like 200,000 years. The stories don't change. The setting the, changes. The setting changes. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like how you can go back and read the Iliad and a lot of, like a lot of the story resonates still. Right. Like a lot of those old stories still make sense. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And and then Ellie's sent back and she says to everybody, you know, 18 I I think about 18 hours have passed. Uh, I saw all this stuff crazy all shit. Things happened yeah. To me. I had this experience and everybody is basically like you were gone for like 30 seconds. Like Yeah, the machine th- malfunctioned. The machine Yeah, this machine malfunctioned. You just dropped straight through. Right. It was it was a 30 second drop and nothing happened. You just ha- had some psych- sort of psychotic experience. And that <laughs> I found was really interesting cuz then you as the viewer have to make up your own mind like right. did Ellie just bonk her head and start tripping balls or did this actually happen? Yeah, and that's the last like 10 15 minutes of the movie, right? Um however, I guess what I should say as well is while she's having that experience with with the aliens they basically say to her as well right like this is just our first point of contact this is our first dialogue that we're having together there's going we have to have more of this before really anything concrete comes from it right yeah um and i I think that's valid right like if if you're about to have first contact with you know a new civilization if you're not there to colonize them you know, you would try to build a relationship with them, build a... Right, and the religious implications are not lost on us, right? Yeah. The whole idea of, like, a prophet who has some kind of secret knowledge and then has to convince the masses. Like, Mm -hmm. this movie isn't being subtle with that message. Well, and here's the other thing as well. Because of the scientific data that they get back that we don't we and we don't know all of the data that they've gotten back at this point, right? Mm -hmm. All we've seen at this point in time is that the machine drops her vessel straight through it nothing happens no what we learn about later is that they did actually record her headset recorded 18 hours 18 hours of static yeah so 
so something happened. Something did happen. And and so, you know, the the powers that be, the politicians, the probably James uh, Woods. James well, James Wood obviously, but the Haddon Corporation would all have this information and there would be future expeditions with the machine mm. there would be future people who would be sent there there would be future dialogues that would happen and it would it would basically you know the the aliens would be essentially testing humanity to see whether or not we would be worthy of joining the galactic stage the federation or yeah. whatever yeah yeah and i thought i thought that was all really interesting and really a really interesting idea and thought mm-hmm. process as well i almost kind of wished this is just me being a dick again but i almost kind of wish they had cut that it's like the movie itself is kind of backpedaling on its own ambiguity right they're kind of confirming that something they're kind of sort of saying that ellie's right and that something did indeed in fact happen yeah like i i don't know i like it, it leaves the door open right like we don't know what's going to happen next like I, it leaves it on a more positive note right like this isn't this isn't a dark movie necessarily no and i did like the final shot of the movie which is just ellie kind of sitting on this mountain like looking up at the sky right and that's pretty much it yeah and that's a good final image for this movie yeah and and that's the thing like this movie has a lot of points in time where they could have ended the film yeah but i think because of the epicness to the size and the ideas of this film. I think that, you know, it does do a good job of providing closure to a lot of the ideas. Mm -hmm. I think I would have been personally rubbed the wrong way if there wasn't any sort of indication that her experience had some basis of truth to it. I guess that's fair. Yeah, I think that would have been a very different movie that I, I think I ultimately would have been more upset by. Right. So yeah, I thought the ending was was pretty effective, actually, because it ends with almost a compromise between science, religion, and politics, right? Ellie and Palmer have a heart-to-heart where Palmer says, you know what, I, I believe you. You know, I I believe in your experience, essentially, right? And Ellie, for the first time, understands how faith works uh, yeah. and how how belief works and then there's even you know some of the the politics behind it too where the politicians find out about what's happened in the background Uh, right i think everything comes together very well well in the end and i i really appreciate it there was you know there was enough ambiguity at the ending like it's funny it feels like the last few movies we've done in this podcast have kind of fallen apart for me in the third act Mm -hmm. or have just weakened a little at the end this movie for me was the opposite where i was Kind of lukewarm on it for Acts 1 and Act 2, and then Act 3 really got me. Yeah. Even as cheesy as maybe the conversation with her dad was at the end, I was kind of like, okay, you did it. You brought it all home. You yep. tied it all together. Like, yep. I'm genuinely impressed. See, and that's that's the thing is, you know, for me, the weakest act of the film is Act 1, but it's because, again, I'll say it, It's a this film is essentially a sci-fi epic, and it takes place over many years. It takes place in many locations and there's a lot of thoughts and ideas going on. And so, you know, it's it, act one is basically the fellowship of the ring. It does a lot of world building. It does, you know, a lot of character building and all of these ideas and building the setting and everything. And it does an effective job at that. It just takes a little bit of time to get going because we really have to understand what the stakes are for everyone. Yeah. No, and you know what? Like, I think, you know, as modern viewers, our attention spans are sometimes worn down to nubs and we just want payoffs right away. But there are movies you just need to sit back and let them unspool a little. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I'm talking to myself with that one. But uh, (laughs) also also you, Gary. (sighs) I hope your name is Gary and you're watching this. Um, What did you think of Matthew McConaughey's character? Let me rephrase. What did you think of his performance? I think Matthew McConaughey is very... He's very charismatic. Yes. And I think that that serves the character well because you have to be a charismatic person to be able to command he's almost following. He's almost like a youth pastor. He's like a yeah. rock star Christian. Yeah. <laughs> Handsome, charismatic rock star Christian. Right. And in the original novel, I don't think he was the exact same 
him and Ellie actually don't even have a relationship in the original novel. I will say, as long as I'm nitpicking, um, I did find the romance a little flat. Yeah. It was kind of, which to be fair, it's not hugely focused upon either, but like, so he sabotages her hearing because he doesn't want her to go to space because he's afraid of losing her. And I was kind of like, looking frowning at the screen i'm like you guys have had sex like maybe one time over the course of four years like what do you mean you can't bear to lose her and like maybe they had some other kind of relationship that was going on behind the scenes but i was just kind of like they had a lot of interactions with each other sure yeah but yeah no you're you're right like it does feel ever so slightly shoehorned now i think you know, Matthew McConaughey was given the task of selling that, right? Jodie Foster has a lot of other heavy lifting she has to do in this film. And Matthew McConaughey, well, basically they were given him the, you have to be charismatic and you have to sell this relationship. And- to be fair, it's a young, charismatic Matthew McConaughey. Like, I would have fallen in love with him. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, who among us is vul- is not vulnerable to those charms? And also, like, yeah, she's very much focused on her work and she's very much less emotionally available than he is right right like there's that scene early in the movie where they hook up and then she basically is just like all right i'll see you around like i gotta go it's like 10 at night she's like i gotta go to the observatory and look at some stars and she's like there's water in the sink and there's snacks in the fridge like i'll see you around right and then he's like well how will i get in contact with you and she's like leave me your number yeah and it's very much it's very much reads she reads as very much like You know, like, yeah, whatever. Like, I'll call you. Just get out of here. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. By the way, to any ladies listening to this podcast, if a man asks you for her your number and you're not interested, just tell him you'll take his number. (laughs) And that'll, you know, that'll protect you. For sure. Yeah. Do you want to talk sequels, prequels, and reboots? Really just, like, get into the background of Carl Sagan? Yeah, I... That's right, people. I came prepared to this one. Um... (laughs) So I do have a list of some of Carl Sagan's most notable scientific accomplishments. Cool. And and I guess we should start with saying that Carl Sagan is the original creator of... The author of the novel that this is based on. Yeah, and, and, and actually even going back in a sense, Carl Sagan originally intended for this to be a film but they couldn't quite acquire the rights to get a, this off the ground. So instead, as they were writing the screenplay, they decided to pivot and write this uh, as a full novel. That's right, yeah, which is funny when those things happen. But yeah. uh, So just going into Mr. Sagan himself, and if you've seen the movie, you'll recognize how some of his own life experience informed this novel. Um, He actually provided research and evidence crucial to our knowledge of Venus. Cool. And these aliens are considered vegans in this movie. Yes. Not vegans, vegans. (laughs) He also um, laid the groundwork for research on extraterrestrial life and contributed to SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, just like Ellie. Well, and what's really cool as well is if you know about the Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 uh, satellites that were sent into deep space, have you seen the plaque of, hum- like, you know, it's the naked man. The naked yeah, man, the he contributed to that as well. Yeah, he was the one who came up with the idea to put that on those just in case someday some something finds those. Right. He also, um, I think there was another Voyager thing where he helped choose the music that they were going to put on this like gold disc right and launch it into space by the way that's something nasa actually did everyone they had a gold like a gold vinyl record full of some of our greatest music and we shot it into the atmosphere i think they sent like also some sounds and stuff like that of of what earth sounds like you know oh really yeah stuff like that yeah, and I believe Sagan was in charge of compiling that. Yeah. He also has some great quotes that I want to read. Um, yeah, very poetic guy. Oh, my personal favorite one is, if you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. <laughs> and just because I'm a writer, I love his quote on books nice. from Cosmos. I'm going to read it in full. What an astonishing thing a book is. It's a flat object made from a tree 
with flexible parts on which are imprinted lots of funny dark squiggles. But one glance at it and you're inside the mind of another person, maybe someone dead for thousands of years. Across the millennia, an author is speaking clearly and silently inside your head directly to you. The other really cool thing is because this was written by Carl Sagan, a lot of the dialogue in this film kind of has that Carl Sagan touch to it. And maybe the most famous one is... And I'm going to tell a full quote. This is actually at the end of the film where Ellie is explained to the children. But the quote, the end of this quote comes up throughout the film. Uh, what she says to the children as, as they're there for their field trip is, I'll tell you one thing about the universe, though. The universe is a pretty big place. It's bigger than anything anyone has ever dreamed of before. So if it's just us, seems like an awful waste of space, right? Yeah, that is a very Carl Sagan-y quote. Yeah. And unfortunately, we should mention that Carl Sagan unfortunately died of bone cancer I think a few months before this movie was released. Yeah, he he was involved in the making of it, and he was consulted throughout the film as they were mm-hmm. making it. Yeah, it's really unfortunate that he didn't get to see part of his life's work get to... And we never really know what he would have thought of the movie, either. I think he would have liked it, you know? Yeah. I think he would have liked it. He seemed like kind of an optimist. Yeah. Yeah, oh, absolutely, he was an optimist. You know, one thing I did hear about Carl Sagan that I wanted to share that is just funny is... So he's probably most known for Cosmos, that eight-part BBC yes, miniseries. Yes, incredible series. So I guess people have noted that there's lots of reaction shots of Carl Sagan just like reacting to things in a very kind of overdramatic way. Right. And some people, I guess Carl Sagan annoyed his producers so much that the producers started splicing extra shots of those in just to make him look weirder. <laughs> <laughs> nice. But it kind of backfired because it just made him more likable. <laughs> Did you see how much how many people have seen Cosmos? Since? It's like the most successful BBC miniseries of all time, right? Yeah. It was what the show has been seen by at least 500 million people across 60 countries. Jesus Christ. Yeah, I remember watching it in school. Wow. That was my first uh taste of Carl Sagan. My first taste of it was um like 15 years ago somebody on YouTube started making like musical remixes. Mhm of some episodes there's one that's called a glorious dawn that i actually still listen to from time to time oh my god (laughs) that's why i first heard that quote like if you wish to make an apple pie from scratch you must first invent the universe (laughs) that was my that was my attempt at a song but anyways so the idea of an encyclopedia galactica that Ellie kind of theorizes about in the movie is actually something that Carl Sagan theorized previous to this work where he uh, he said that it was essentially, it, the thought process was a database of all the worlds in the Milky Gal- Way galaxy. And he actually brings that up in, in Cosmos. So the thoughts of aliens and ideas. And actually all of that comes back to a term that comes from the sci-fi novel series, The Foundation, or Foundation, sorry, Oh, um, yeah. Which is a TV uh, series on Apple Plus right now. Isaac Asimov, right? Yeah. You know, my old, uh, my one of my best friends actually got it for me years ago and I never read it. But he, <laughs> still, he still talks about how it's like his favorite piece of written work ever. Yeah, it's up there with uh, Dune, right? As one of the most important sci-fi pieces of literature ever it would, written. It would have to be. Yeah, it is. By the way, did you hear that Dune Part 2 has been delayed to next year? Yeah, I That's know. heartbreaking yeah. for you. <laughs> I am just I am disappointed. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, it's it's the exciting part of Dune, right? Like the first part of Dune is the first hour act of this movie. It's doing all the heavy lifting, world building. Yeah, event. I'm more just excited to see uh, Christopher Walken as the Emperor of Space. <laughs> yeah, I I'm like, yeah, <laughs> Paul, you gotta calm down. <laughs> That was a terrible Christopher Walken. I want to talk about a couple of the differences to the book to the movie. Oh, Um, yeah, I bet you do, because there are some dramatic ones. So I have a couple, and if you've got a couple as well you want to share, the one that I was going to talk about was at the end of the novel, the vessel that Ellie is in, uh, where she's dropped through the machine. So when, when they pull her out of the machine, there's actually sand inside of the machine. Oh that, yeah, she's being. Oh, uh, I'm glad they cut that out. Yeah, well, and and that's kind of it's kind of interesting actually because there's other elements of that as well because in the novel I think there was 12 people like the machine was built for 12 and so 12 people oh, yeah. all go inside of it and they're all dropped and they all have kind of that 
experience together. Right. They all see different visions, right? Yeah. 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 And that, from a novel standpoint, from a realistic standpoint, that makes a lot more sense to, you know, send 12 people because if you're if you're trying to make contact with another alien life why would you just send one person right like why wouldn't you why wouldn't you build a machine that's able to facilitate like a larger conversation i guess they kind of hand wave it it's like oh well we're just following the aliens blueprints but yeah wouldn't a real engineer or architect just be like well we can just add some chairs (laughs) yeah and and so i think that it makes a lot more sense in the novel but i think for movie purposes for entertainment purposes it makes a lot more sense to have one person well this is already a long movie right and it would just complicate things yeah exactly exactly. if you were doing a mini series you could do that but not a movie no and so i think that was made for as a movie decision, as an entertainment decision, that I, I actually do agree with that, even though I think it makes more sense in the novel. Haddon, in the novel, very different person in the novel, very different outcome to his character. He was in his 50s in the novel, perfectly healthy. Uh, he goes to space to extend his life, similar to the movie. However, at the end of the book, he fakes his own death, he gets cryogenically frozen, and then he's shot into deep space. So he basically What a mad lad. <laughs> yeah. His his plan is to eventually become immortal in hopes that an an advanced alien civilization picks him up and makes him immortal. <laughs> Have you ever watched the Venture Bros, the no. Adult Swim cartoon? There's a character in that uh, General Timothy Tracer who has colon cancer. So he freezes himself and launches himself into space so that aliens can find him and cure his cancer. That's definitely uh uh, from this that, wow from the i okay <laughs> uh, by the way people don't do that it probably won't work <laughs> <laughs> but it's pretty damn cool yeah I mean, if you're gonna die right like you there could be there's worse ways to use your body to just launch yourself into the atmosphere yeah that yeah. seems fun i mean it's pretty expensive it's pretty big waste of resources but blake are you trying to tell me something i would love for you to shoot my body in a space okay uh, well i you I are absolutely going to outlive me but if by some miracle i outlive you i will definitely do that cool when my book is released y'all gotta buy it so i can afford a space cannon for blake <laughs> <laughs> nice those were the ones that I thought were the most interesting. Were there other, any other like book to movie comparisons? You yeah, make? what's actually so? There's actually some personal drama in the book that didn't make it into the movie. Mm-hmm. So I guess in the movie, Ellie's mom is dead. She's been dead for a long time, right? And then her father passes away. So in the book, her mom actually didn't die. Oh, so and then get this: her mom remarries some guy like pretty much right away and mm-hmm. it's kind of comes out that she was having an affair on the dad oh i did read about all of right this. and then this ellie's stepdad is really emotionally abusive and keeps discouraging her interest in science and like he pulls right. the whole like no man is gonna want too smart a wife <laughs> and then in like the final chapter it comes out that her dick's stepfather is actually her real dad right biologically and that her mom had this affair, has been having this affair for a while, clearly, and that her douchey stepfather is actually her dad, and the man she thought was her father was not her biological father. Right, right. And that's something I'm glad they took out. I agree, because it's kind of... It's a little needlessly complicated. And derivative, like, we've seen that before. And I'm sure maybe Carl Sagan was trying to make a point in the book, maybe about just you know, choosing your own legacy or what have you. Like, I'm sure it made sense in the book, but in just this movie in particular, it just would have been weird. Yeah. It would have just been strange. Yeah, it would have added a lot to the film. Like, they would have had to cut other parts that were more interesting or more necessary to the overall story that they were telling. I I agree that's a necessary And yeah, I'm sure, again, I'm sure there's some kind of grander thematic point that the book is trying to make with that, but it just seems odd. For this movie in this tone, it would just seem odd. Yeah, I, I very much agree. Yeah. I think that overall, the adaptation without reading the novel, which I think I will potentially get to at some point, because I am a big Carl Sagan guy. Yeah, that's true, actually. I'm actually, I'm still reading Silence of the Lambs, and maybe I'll pick this one up after. Neat. So this pod, I'm going to start a concurrent podcast called Michael Reads, where I read the novelizations of the movies we talk about. Do it. I'd love to hear that. Yeah. 
You're going to have to edit yourself, though. <laughs> yeah, and it'll just be me talking to myself, screaming into the void. I've heard podcasts like that. I listen to podcasts like that, so yeah. it's not, not unheard of. You won't be there to censor me, so yeah. I can just say whatever I want. <laughs> Which, to be fair, I pretty much do on this podcast, I mean, someday too. we'll get to start my uh, Samuel Jackson podcast idea. Does he look like a bitch? <laughs> I'd love to contribute to that. <laughs> <laughs> I really want to do that at some point, but that's here nor there. So, effects and filming. Where I'm going to start with this is the potential movie that we almost got and compare it to the movie that we did get. Okay. Because this film almost was adapted in 93, Warner Brothers hired George Miller as the director. Really? Yes. George Miller. Oh, this would have been a really different movie. Well, and think about like the movie that we got is very consistent with the tone of Rog Robert Zemeckis's other films. Zemeckis, yeah. yeah. Think of George Mill the tone of George Miller's films. <laughs> no, the, there would have been a Ellie just as the machine activates, she sprays chrome in her face and screams, Witness me! Yeah. <laughs> I would like to see that actually. He did cast Jodie Foster in the lead role, so that would have been consistent. Ralph Fiennes was originally thought of to play Palmer Joss. Oh, the Ralph Fiennes? The like, Ralph Fiennes. Lord Voldemort Ralph Fiennes. Yes. Wow, that's hilarious. He almost played Palmer Joss. So, very <laughs> different portrayal of the character. I think that would have been more consistent with the novelization version of Palmer Joss. You know what? I'm just picturing uh, his character from the menu mm -hmm. just being like... <laughs> <laughs> wearing his little cook chef smock. I love smock. that movie. It's a, a good one. It's a good one. People people pre uh, gave it a bit of a hard time for being too on the nose, but I actually, I thought it was quite entertaining. No, I saw it on a date in theaters and we both had a really good time. Mm -hmm. Tyler's bullshit. Total <laughs> lack of cohesion. <laughs> 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 oh, and hey, guess what? Um, What's his name from Knox from Fury Road was in that movie yeah, he too. Was. There's a lot of famous actors in that film. So, I highly recommend watching the menu at some point if you haven't seen it already. Yes, that's right. Put it on the menu. <laughs> Move on. <laughs> um, There was some consideration to casting Linda Hunt as the president of the United States. That would have been cool. Instead of... Bill Clinton. <laughs> Instead of uh, actual Bill Clinton. I feel, I think I read somewhere that the White House was actually kind of miffed about that. They sent some kind of a letter to Oh, we'll, Param get, it, we'll get into all of that very soon in the effects and film. Okay, because that's honestly, out of all the effects, that's the one I found the most interesting. Yes. Like I, watching this movie on my laptop, I was like, is that fucking Bill Clinton? Yeah. Did yeah, they, yeah. did Bill Clinton show up on set? <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we could talk about it now. So Bill Clinton his appearance in the film because it's a few cut shots in between the you know there's some discussion of him talking there's an entrance into the room where they're discussing everything they clearly use a body double at different points yes Just... but also like i think that they actually were using shots of bill clinton and then splicing it in and then when we didn't see bill clinton is when he wasn't actually there like i think i i don't think they used a lot of body doubles minus like you know seeing showing some like Without shoulders face, hair shots, yeah. yeah stuff like that so his appearance in the film is actually taken from a real press release that happened in 97 like you know months before this like ripped from the headlines throw it in yeah, yeah. and that's not the only thing that this uh, film actually takes from very contemporary journalism but anyway the so the reason why he's speaking and why this all kind of ties in is he was actually talking about a real life discovery in uh, like the Arctic, right? And yeah, in Antarctica, there was a meteorite that was found that actually turned out to be from Mars. It was Martian in nature. Wow. So they kind of altered, cut it, so that in a way that it made more sense for the film. And that actually caused, like you said, a lot of controversy. And they did send a cease and desist letter, I believe, or they what they s sent to the studio was like, a, you know, never do this again. <laughs> yeah. We are not, we are none too impressed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's kind of funny. Like, I was watching it and I was thinking about it afterwards. We're like, why don't more movies just do this? Yeah. Like, throw in. That's what I thought. I had the exact same thought, too. Yeah. I was like, it works perfectly. I mean, like, and I mean, to be fair, like, the address he's giving fits so well with the plot that I'm sure the producers and the director were just like, fuck it. We're taking it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Let's ask for forgiveness, not permission. Yeah. Like, this is a gift from God. This is perfect. Just yeah. throw it in. Well, and, and how shortly it came out before the release of this film as well. Like, they probably, 
They would have had to do some like last minute reshoots probably to edit it in properly. I can imagine I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall when Bill Clinton watched the movie and he saw himself. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, whoa, um, Hillary, get in here. Uh, so Jodie Foster's portrayal. So she actually did get to spend some time with Carl Sagan. Um, cool. And she actually spent some time with Dr. Jill Tarter, who was the director of SETI. So that's who the character is actually based on there is some basis in reality to her portrayal and and what they're trying to portray there they filmed all of those shots uh at the very large array in new mexico and that was actually one of the more difficult spots that they were filming at because you know this was the real vla it was in operation while they were filming and so they had to negotiate with the scientists there to actually get some dish control while they were also trying to do their own research to make it you know more dramatic for the film right interesting and and i'm glad they did because it it is especially the scene you know when she's on her car and we get the first contact like without all of the you know the noises of them moving like it's very ominous and there's that great moment where she calls into her buddies in the control station and they're just kind of fucking around yeah and they don't hear her at first right and then finally they pick her up and she's just screaming coordinates and they're like moving the dishes around like it's a great sequence yeah it's a very spielbergian sequence yes yes it is i very much agree the suicide pill scene, we didn't mention this because it's kind of a small moment. It's um, kind of an afterthought, yeah, really. It is when, before Ellie gets in, they give her this little pill and they say, you know, this is a suicide pill. If anything goes wrong, if you want if you want a quick end, here it is. That caused a lot of controversy when it came out because... Do astronauts not do that? So Carl, in Carl Sagan's mind, that was something that was provided on every single NASA mission. On the flip side, there was an astronaut who was part of the Apollo 13 mission, he says that that actually never happened. That that was completely BS. Okay. So so there's differences of opinion, but they ended up deciding, you know what, It for d- dramatic point, we'll, it, we'll, conti- it we'll works, keep it in. It also makes sense, right? There, We have no idea where this is sending you or what it's doing. Like, right. if you're in danger and there's no way out, just here you go, yeah, right? Yeah, there's a way out. I would have loved to her to have been like, you know, how do I get the aliens to take it? Yeah. You know, like the famous get smart quote. <laughs> <clears throat> Anyways. Robert Zemeckis talked about S.R. Haddon and his inspiration for it. And his inspiration was what would happen if a Bill Gates type lost his mind? <laughs> yeah. We're that's living pretty... that right now, actually. We certainly are. <laughs> actually, it's now it's more like Bill Gates is the only one who's kept his mind. Yeah. There's a lot of cuts to journalism, specifically CNN, in the film. Uh, there's actually 25 CNN reporters, like Larry and Larry King was also involved. In also it. Jay Leno. Yeah. yeah. Um, so those were all filmed specifically for the movie. This is one of the last times that that ever happens because after this, CNN decided that they, they this banned is bad the for our brand or yeah, something. They, yeah, they banned the use of their logo. They said, you know, you journalists can't do this anymore. The only one who had special clearance to do any of that was Larry King. Got some more movie appearances after the fact, but otherwise... Larry King was apparently a pretty funny guy. Like, yeah. He would just appear as himself in things. Yeah. Did you ever watch Gravity Falls? Uh, I've seen like an episode. He voices a wax sculpture of himself in one episode. Interesting. It's, it's actually really funny. <laughs> I mean, a lot of a lot of actors do that, right? In like The Simpsons and stuff. Yeah, but, yeah. But yeah, so so this was like the last time that this was used, uh, and then after that, they were like, you know what, we need to maybe distance ourselves from from this. Anyway, th- those are all the big uh, effects and filming stuff that we hadn't already talked about beforehand. So let's get into score really quickly. I personally big fan of the score. It was scored by Alan Silvestri. That's the name you're probably familiar with. Yes. Very big composer, like one of the most important composers of the 20th century. And he's actually scored most of Robert Zemeckis' movies, including like the Back to the Future series, uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, Forrest Gump, all the stuff we talked about in the Primer episode. He was also really important to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Uh, he scored the Avengers. Oh, that has a great score. Yeah. Uh, I actually remember and heard it. Nice. <laughs> it, it's pretty good score throughout, but it also mixes in the music of the, the 90s, right? And like I said in the opening shot, 
there's the opener and as we kind of pan out past earth and into the solar system and then out of the solar system we get a time capsule of all the music as as we get further and further out right um so it goes from the 90s right back into the 30s when hitler's speech starts so i'm, I'm gonna give you a couple of like examples just like maybe each decade of songs that get played in that scene uh we get third eye bly semi-charmed life is where it starts uh funky town in the 70s mr misters broken wings the 80s r2d2's whistle is in there <laughs> richard nixon i do remember nixon yeah vividly from him there's a quote from neil armstrong landing on the moon there's the news about robert kennedy being shot martin luther king's speech has a clip john f kennedy being shot the Twilight Zone theme, going back to the 50s, the Lone Ranger theme from the 40s, and then getting into the 30s, the Wizard of Oz over the rainbow. And then at the very end, and, and this is a cool callback later in the film, is the very end, there's a almost unrecognizable Adolf Hitler speech at the very end. Oh, clever. Yes. Very clever. Yeah. Well, and actually, if you think about it too, because we're not in the solar system at this point in time, this is when Ellie's like, you know, 10 years old, right? Right. And so it's on its way out of the solar system and on its way to Vega, but it hasn't gotten there yet. So it's all really well designed to... Yeah, those audio engineers deserve a clap on the back. Yeah really well thought out like uh, this is a pretty tight movie all those uh different like sound bites too are almost kind of thematically tie in with the subject matter yeah well at least relate to it and and there's more when we get to the pop-up city around the seti satellite or dishes Mm. um there's a lot of different music and a lot of different themes and ideas throughout that too huh Ooh, look back at the times uh so we mentioned how bill clinton fits into all of this but there is actually something else that's very relevant to the 90s and very relevant to 97 is they mention in one of the news broadcasts in the movie that uh health officials from around the world are concerned that the message from the vega might trigger a rash of mass suicides not unlike the recent cult deaths near san san diego oh yeah how could we forget heaven's gate heaven's gate yes so heaven gate heaven's gate happened four months before the movie was released so they ended up deciding to cut that in uh if you don't know what heaven's gate is it was a cult that i think almost 40 people ended up taking cyanide and uh committing a mass suicide together thinking that their souls were going to be picked up by a comet passing earth yeah i i i don't think it happened (laughs) i don't think it worked we'll never know (laughs) i guess we won't (laughs) legacy so I, I really liked that they dedicated the movie to carl sagan at the end the four carl was really for carl that was touching This isn't strictly a legacy kind of thing, but the whole idea of like, we need to build this machine to get somewhere and we don't really know how, what it'll do. I was getting kind of Fallout 4 vibes from that. You know, when they, you know, in Fallout 4, when you have to build the machine to transport yourself to the Institute, did you play far far enough into Fallout 4? Okay. Well, that's kind of the vibe I was getting from it. And I just (laughs) wanted to share that. Fair enough. Okay. Go on. (laughs) The other legacy bit I want to talk about was Palmer Joss. When they talk about Einstein's theory theory of relativity, how essentially if Ellie does somehow go into the machine and it does send her to Vega, how if she's moving at the speed of light, four years will pass for her, but 26 years will pass for her going to Vega. Oh, I think I did read about this. Yeah. Yeah. So how over 50 years would have passed for her to go to Vega and back. And so everybody that she cares about would be dead in that time and how how much earth will have changed and all of that's based in like you know a real theory from einstein and that actually comes around in interstellar that's a really important point of interstellar as well with matthew mcconaughey's character so kind of a cool you know connection to thing those two films. yeah so this ends up this movie ends up in roger ebert's great movies list actually of course it does um yeah big fan of this one what i thought was really interesting about this film is Actually, I'll ask you right now, Rotten Tomatoes, what do you think the critic score was on Rotten Tomatoes versus the audience score? I feel like critics are probably higher on this movie than the audience. Okay. You got any... Uh, I'd put critics at like maybe 
five and audiences at like maybe 62. These are just ballpark numbers I'm throwing out there. Okay. Critics were actually less. Oh, I had the opposite. Yeah. They were 68%. Audiences were a 78%. Okay. So approximately. I think I'm out by a couple percentage points here, but the point that I'm making is they, it shares almost the exact same Rotten Tomatoes score comparatively critics to audiences as Don't Look Up, which I thought was really interesting. That is interesting. Um, because they're two films exploring adjacent ideas uh, about humanity. Certainly different tones, but yeah, similar tones. ideas. Yeah. Uh, so I thought that was kind of interesting because I think that a film like this, a film like Don't Look Up, is going to certainly rub some people the wrong way. Ye- well, certain people. Yeah. Sp- cer- certainly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, I just I just thought that it was really interesting how those two movies kind of mirror each other from a critic audience score perspective. That is very interesting. Personal reviews, the partner factor. I want to hear your review first. Okay, I did not watch this with Emily, Mm -hmm. but I did call her later to complain that I was a little (laughs) underwhelmed by the movie. (laughs) Sorry, guys. It's not a bad movie. It's just, you know what it is? It's just, it's not really a Michael movie. Right. So, and, and why is it a Michael movie? I don't know. You know, I've watched a lot of sci-fi with you and with Pedin, my other best friend. And like, I don't know what it is, but like, do you remember when we watched Annihilation yep. last year? Great movie. I kind of bounced right off it. It's one of I w- my favorites of all time. I know. And it was not a bad movie. And I'm not saying this is a bad movie. I'm just saying it wasn't really for me yep and Patton and i watched alien aliens last year too again not a bad movie but i was kind of bored and underwhelmed by it so Fair maybe enough. there's just something about this sci-fi aesthetic that doesn't do it for me and also i did just find it a little i'm not i am not a bad guy but i did find this movie a little schmaltzy at times too in What sense? Just in terms of like the heavy handedness of some of the dialogue, the very kind of whimsical, upbeat tone. Mm -hmm. Let let, 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 let me just put a pin in it. I like my movies dour, intense, and depressing. (laughs) (laughs) Now, if Ellie had blown up on impact, I would have been like, nice. Oh my God. (laughs) This is a great movie. I'm being sarcastic. But Mm. yeah, it just wasn't really a Michael movie. I greatly, greatly, greatly liked Silence of the Lambs a lot more. Yeah, and and that's fair. Like, I don't think there are many people who are going to say that Silence of the Lambs is not as good of a movie as Contact. Like, Silence of the Lambs is objectively one of the greatest movies ever made. Certainly. Um, They're both trying to achieve very different things, Mm -hmm. I think, is one thing to take into consideration when comparing the two. Again, personally, I thought Jodie Foster had a lot more had to shoulder a lot more of the weight in this film like you know her performance is kind of what makes this film sink or swim and i thought she i thought her performance in this was more of a shining beacon of what she has to offer than silence of the lambs like silence of the lambs is great don't get me wrong Mm -hmm. but you know it's yeah it's this film that stars anthony hopkins and it's one of the greatest on-screen performances of all time buffalo bill is incredible as well there's you know she she's sharing a screen presence and and you know what? I feel like I liked her performance a little more in Silence, but that might just be because I liked her character more. Yeah. Because her character felt like more of an underdog. Right. Not to say she's not an underdog in this movie, but like Clarice is clearly younger and less experienced than Dr. Eleanor Arroway. Yeah, and less sure of herself. Certainly, yeah. Okay, my, my review, I love this movie. I, I think... I really appreciated the realistic approach to the material. Like like you said, the last act of the film is where the sci-fi really amps up. Mm-hmm. And it's not to say that I hated that, but you know, as soon as contact is made, I'm hooked. I'm in this movie through like I'm going to sit down and watch the whole rest of this movie and and be fully engaged in it. Jodie Foster's performance massive high for me. It's a really fascinating film because of the timelessness of the subject material. Even even if it's about first contact with aliens, something that's never happened, potentially never will happen. It, it's more about the ideas of humanity and and what we represent as a culture and as a species and and all of these different ideas, like how how different but the same we are, how how different we are to 
people of the past, but how, how similar we are and how, you know, a lot of these ideas and concepts never really die. And so for me, I actually think this makes my top 100 list of greatest movies of all time. I, I don't know that it's, it's definitely not in my top 20. It's probably not in my top 70, but I bet you it makes the tail end of my top 100 list somewhere. It's a pretty damn good movie. And I, like I said in the first episode, I'm kind of ashamed that I hadn't seen it before because I really appreciated it. And I'm looking forward to a rewatch to see if I'm as enchanted by it as I was in, in this watch because it, it did it did a lot for me. I, I, I really, really appreciated everything this film had going for it. Yeah, While also absolutely. being able to acknowledge that it did have some faults. Yeah. What did Jess think of it? Jess was a big fan of this one, actually. She she really enjoyed it as well. I think Silence, again, like, I don't think you'll find uh, many people who would argue that Contact is better than Except Silence. Except really Gene don't. Siskel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Boosh. Uh, Critics aren't always right, people. Yeah, that's hilarious. But yeah, no, she really enjoyed this one. I think that, so, again, Silence was more interesting to her the the science and the mathematical ideas of the film definitely not gonna you know it's check just boxes off for is her. just a science person not necessarily i don't think she's an english major like more she's probably more consistently enjoys similar stuff to maybe you than me slightly but not necessarily always uh, we've, you we've watched some movies together that you were a big fan of or even tv shows that you're big a fan of that she bounces off of so yeah, she she got her own taste. But That's fair. Everyone does, people. Yeah, she she appreciated this one. I think she enjoyed this one, but uh, this is I, more I'm of like on. this is more of a wholesome, upbeat kind of sci-fi too. Yeah, so I can we see we don't get very often. I was just gonna say no. A lot of sci-fi is very dour and existential and cynical. Well, this one has that, but it it also ends on a higher note. You know, it's more optimistic for the future of humanity. It it ends on a note of like, yeah, no, there are aliens and they're actually kind of okay like yeah you know they're pretty decent they seem pretty cool yeah i really really enjoyed this one and i hope that the viewers do it as well yes because that concludes our jody foster series certainly does looking forward into september there's a chance we might take a break because i have a wedding in september blake is getting married people Um, and yours truly is emceeing the wedding (laughs) So, so if I don't show up again, it means I did a terrible job and Blake <laughs> ended my our friendship. <laughs> nice. So we'll see. I think we'll end up probably only end up doing one episode in September. Uh, so I'm not sure exactly when that's going to be, what that's going to look like. There will be a break at some point, I know, though. Okay. I'm about to start a new job, too, so I wouldn't be opposed to a break. Yeah. Yeah, and and there's a chance that Jason might be able to record alternatively, but I think I think you're only probably going to be getting one movie in September, and then uh, October's your choice to start off with, and we already know what we're doing. I think for it, I might change my mind at the last second. <laughs> I am prone to doing that. Nice. Um. Yeah. Right now, the idea is probably good, bad, and the ugly, though, right? That is probably what we're going to do, but I may change my mind at the last second. No, completely. Fair. Good, the bad, and the ugly, though. Probably my all-time favorite movie. Yeah. Love yeah, it. Yeah. For those of you at home who are trying to get a bead on me, just look at that movie. That's my platonic ideal of a perfect movie. Nice. <laughs> nice. All right, cool. So until next time, tell your dad. Tell your dad. Yeah. Hopefully Father he's movie, Hopefully he's still alive. <laughs> Lucky you. Oh, my God. <laughs> All right. Bye.